Hi everyone, thank you so much. It's such a, an honor to be opening this amazing second symposium of a whole series in the General Ecology Project. Um, so you mentioned wanting to make this topic a bit more bodily. And so I'm actually gonna start by guiding you in a meditation. Um, so if you'd like to close your eyes to start and nestle yourself in your seat, and I'm hoping that this can be a way to start that's a little less intellectual because I have a tendency to go very intellectual. So take a deep breath in. Make yourself comfortable. And just sense into the feeling of your body. Sense into the feeling of your sitting bones pressing into a cushion or into the cushion of your seat or your hands resting on your lap. And we're starting by focusing on everything that's solid in the body. So I'm asking you to think of your bones, of the solidness of your feet on the floor. We're calling everything that is solidity and earth element into mind. So that's your teeth and bones. The material of your bones, calcium carbonate, is the same material out in the world of thinking of rocks. There have been organisms over millions of years that have contributed to those rocks. And the very same atoms in your bones are atoms that may have been part of bones of dinosaurs many, many years ago. They're the same atoms as cliffs on Dover Beach. There's actually a, a particular species of algae, coccolithophores, that um, contribute to this calcium, so I'm calling them into mind too. And eventually this solid solidness, all of this rock inside your body, returns to the earth and we're shedding skin all the time. Shedding bacteria, taking in new bacteria. So now let's think about the, everything that's liquid. Think of what you can directly experience in your body. The saliva in your mouth, in your eyes, in your nose. The mucus lining your throat, your stomach. The pulse in your blood. And now think of all of everything that's liquid outside, the vast oceans and rivers, rains and clouds, water permeating in the soil, and water inside other organisms, water inside other animals, the saliva of a sheep, the blood of a salamander. We're thinking of the biofilms Think of all of all that liquid, all the teeming life that's inside that liquid, both outside and inside. And that liquid is continuous. And these water molecules on your breath that you're breathing in and out, they're the very same water molecules acted on by cyanobacteria two billion years ago as they first converted water into oxygen, which allowed us to be here. And now an easy one, focusing in on the breath as it rushes in and out on each breath through your nose or through your mouth. And then focusing on the air outside, the breeze, the wind through the trees, through the leaves. The air molecules deep inside being carried in your blood carrying oxygen molecules to your mitochondria deep inside your cells. And this brings us onto the element of fire. These tiny bacteria deep inside your cells are working very, very hard all the time to provide you with the energy that allows you to walk, to think. Every single electrical impulse 
that allows you to pick up a pencil, a cup. Millions of years ago, these mitochondria were converted from a free-living bacteria into the tiny powerhouse inside every single one of your cells today. They were engulfed, they were enslaved, they were kept captive. And now they're responsible for stripping all of your food molecules that you take inside your body, stripping them of electrons, of energy, allowing you to live. If you focus in on the warmth of your breath as it comes out after you've breathed in, when you breathe out, that heat, you can thank the millions of mitochondria for keeping you warm. Now focusing into your heartbeat. This heartbeat has been a continuous heartbeat down the whole evolutionary chain of living beings that led you to be here today. When you were an ape, when you were a small mammal, a fish. And then think about the time when, before there were, even was a heartbeat when you were just a cluster of cells. And then when you were just a single bacteria. And from that single bacteria, now a multicellular organism housing millions of bacteria, all working together in concerted action. We're really here thanks to cooperation. We're an unbroken chain of being, hundreds of thousands of generations, an unbroken lineage of life. And it's thanks to all the times that that chain of beings cooperated that allows us to be here. When we huddled as small mammals, when we came together as intricate and complex symbioses, engulfing bacteria, becoming chimeric, multicellular mosaics of beings. So in a second, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. But I ask you to take a, an element of this realization and maybe this feeling of wonder with you on this journey today as we hear all the speakers. So if you'd like to take a breath in, take a bit of a stretch, come back to this multicellular whole being sitting here. I will jump into telling you a little bit about uh, some of the symbioses that um, take up my time thinking about. So I love this title, We Were Never One, because it was quite meta when I first saw it. It's when I thought, when I was thinking about it, you know, there are many dimensions to the fact that we're not one. You know, we were never one organism, but also we were nev we've never been one being. So within the paradigm of biology, we're really, I, I really feel we're having a very big shift in paradigms as we try and look at this definition of the organism or of the, the individual, uh, biological individual. So I just thought I'd start off, Lynn Margulis is a very big inspiration to me and, a, and, I'm, and I'm a huge fan of her work and I'm very excited to be watching her film on the 11th of December here with the Serpentine. Um, and this is in one of her textbooks. I can't, I'm, I'm gonna try and, and, I need to turn this way to look at the screen and then <laughs> make sure that I get the microphone. I was raised in the belief that these mitochondria were obscure little engines inside my cells, owned and operated by me or my cellular delegates, private submicroscopic bits of my intelligent flesh. Now it appears some of them, and the most important ones, are total strangers. So I include this because it's quite an emotional topic, even for scientists. I'm, I'm really enjoying reading some papers on this topic at the moment, 
And sometimes in the conclusion, you have the scientists finish. Usually in science, you're not supposed to write papers with emotion and, and with kind of personality. But recently, at the end of these papers, you have scientists saying, it's, you know, we're really facing this shocking blurring of organisms and, and considering that even humans are super organisms or meta organisms. So it's a very exciting time to be both a scientist and an artist working in this field. So I, I started off by asking you to think about uh, your mitochondria. And I'm going to start my talk by really focusing on this. If you think of this as the symbiosis of Christmas past or you know, the deep, a deep symbiosis that happened a very long time ago, uh, and then we're going to go on to think about this, all of the symbioses that exist today. So billions of years ago, something like what you see on this screen happened with a eukaryotic cell and a bacteria. And that cell, that marriage of two cells, that chimera ended up evolving into what you all are today. I can't play this video, but I encourage you to go onto YouTube and type in uh, amoeba eats paramecium. Um, I teach at an alternative university about biology with, from a holistic lens, and we teach in, a, in an experiential way, and a lot of our students are quite sensitive. Um, and this video really caused a lot of upset um, when I showed it to them a couple weeks ago. So I'm not going to show it here without a trigger warning, but you can go and have a look on YouTube. So what you can see here is, yeah, this is just to give you an idea of that first engulfing event. And a question that a lot of scientists ask themselves is what, you know, what happened back, way back when that happened? Was it that that cell you know, was trying to engulf and eat the bacteria? Or was it that the bacteria uh, invaded the eukaryotic cell? Um, it's something we, we spend time thinking about. This is a, a kind of cartoon representation. I mean, just to get a sense of who's in the room, how many of you were aware, like consciously aware, that your mitochondria come from bacteria? So that looks like 50%. So I hope maybe that's kind of blown your mind for today, for the remaining 50%. <laughs> so this is just an image from a, a paper that I wrote a couple years ago with a, a colleague, Richard Dorrell. Um, and we were thinking about, you know, we, within, I mean, since Darwin presented you know, origin of species and, and a lot of what we learn at school is Darwinian evolution, we're really wired to see life as something that comes from competition and something that, you know, nature read in tooth and claw. And because of this lens, you know, it's very difficult, it's been sometimes very difficult for scientists to see what's right in front of their eyes, which is that actually a lot of life comes from cooperation. It comes from relationship. It comes from different organisms um, almost displaying I don't want to anthropomorphize, but like trust or, you know, actually helping each other out with the hope that that's going to work out for the better. And at first, when, when scientists started seeing these examples of symbiosis, or if you think about Lynn Margulis and her, so Lynn Margulis is famous, for those of you who don't know, for her theory of endosymbiosis. So before the 1970s, nobody knew, it, it wasn't common knowledge that mitochondria, you know, came from an original engulfment uh, event and came from bacteria. So that's only 50 years ago. So before, you know, it was a huge, a huge realization. Um, and I think for a long time within the scientific community, we thought um, perhaps events like that were an oddity. But actually what we're realizing is perhaps they're much more like the rule. If you look at this slide, you can have a, you can see all of the different kinds of evolutionary adaptation that have to evolve for a cell to be able to successfully um, inhabit a bacteria inside it. Okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that. But you can see four different examples. So one of them is, you know, when you take it, I'm, I'm going to ask you to imagine taking a bacteria into, your, you know, to one of your cells. So if you want to take control of that bacteria and turn it into a part of yourself, you're going to have to get that bacteria's DNA to move from its cell into your own genome. 
So that's like a huge, you know, that would have taken many, many, many years. And what I'm trying to explain with this slide is that there are many different adaptations that need to take place to allow that to happen. And yet, that uh, symbiosis event must have happened many times for all of these things to evolve. So I think on the slide we've got um, genes moving to the nucleus. You'd also need to be able to change metabolites, which means basically um, molecules like oxygen or carbon dioxide or, or food molecules. You would need to be able to swap those from the bacteria with your cell. Uh, and what else? Yeah, and also you need to be able to take control of that bacteria in when your cell divides, you want your cells to all have a copy of that. Anyway, I think this is getting a bit technical, so let's, let's move on. Um, so this word symbiosis, this is the topic that uh, I spend a lot of my time thinking and writing and teaching about. And the word symbiosis comes from the Greek sim, together, and biosis, living. So it's very simple, living together. And we see it everywhere. We see it all, around, all over life. And as I said before, I think we're seeing it more and more now because often you can only find things if you're looking for them. So if we've been spending our time as scientists look at kind of interrogating reality with this lens of life being competition, we've been missing out on seeing a lot of those interrelationships, those entanglements, those cooperations. That's just, uh, this is me in a past life as a, as a lab scientist. These are some bacteria on the plates. I couldn't find a picture of what I was looking for, which was um, we used to do some kind of DIY bio experiments, taking swabs from our uh, belly buttons and um, spreading them on plates like the plates that I'm holding there. Um, and I have to tell you that the result of those uh, swabbings of, of um, belly button bacteria were much less beautiful than the ones you see here. And when I was, a, when I was practicing science, I was actually uh, focusing much more on plants and algae. I'm not going to focus so much on that uh, for this, but um, this is just to show you that within the algal uh, family, so within, I mean, algae, you'll probably be um, familiar with through the nori on your sushi or kelp in the sea, but within the algal family, you've actually got cases where a cell has engulfed a bacteria uh, chlor to make a chloroplast, and that cell then engulfs another bacteria, and then that organism engulfs another organism. So here you can see the very complex genomic evolutionary tree of algae, uh, and this was my gateway to symbiosis and realizing how crazy things can get. Uh, you literally have some algae with the genomes of up to five or six different uh, sister and brother algae within them because they've gone through so many engulfing events, taken the DNA of those algae and then thrown away the algae. They, they, there's a paper that um, the title of which is Shopping for Plastids. You know, you've got basically these organisms that just engulf, steal DNA and move on. So this is just to say that symbiosis and endosymbiosis, which is living together within. So when a cell takes a bacteria or an organism inside itself, that's endosymbiosis, it's not an oddity. It's actually the basis on which a lot of life is built. So here's Lynn. Life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. And she's really been a hero for me. Um, her real contribution to the scientific community was this idea of symbiogenesis. So symbiosis is living together but symbiogenesis is symbiosis being an actual engine for evolution and life and the creation of new organisms, which uh, Lynn herself believed to be the biggest drive of evolutionary, um, yeah, evolution. And so I mentioned I teach now in this alternative university. So Lynn Margulis herself used to teach at Schumacher College. Uh, Schumacher is in the south of England, and this here on the left is the classroom that Lynn used to teach in, uh, and I, I feel honored enough to be teaching. This is just a, a picture after the class on symbiosis, so you can see some of the complex diagrams on the, on the board. Um, and so this, this university does something which is quite um, rebellious, or I would say, which is that they teach science, that, well, we teach science from a lens of holism, so from a lens of you know, relationship of 
uh, cooperation. It's a very different way of looking at science, as well as other things like Gaia theory and um, Goethean science. So if you're interested in this topic, I urge you to have a look at Schumacher. Um, so this here is a, a paper by Scott Gilbert, who, you know, it, the title is We've Never Been Individuals, and I just wanted to presence him here as well, because I believe that he's been a very big inspiration, both to me and to, to others, too. So I mentioned, you know, we started off with the, the kind of ghost of symbiosis past, my, you know, mitochondria deep inside your cells, and that happened billions of years ago, but actually, you know, even today, as we'll probably hear later on, there's a ton of symbioses in, in you know, going on in your body and actually making you a, a, an individual or a non-individual today. This is an artist, let me just find the name, Rebecca D. Harris, uh, and her work is called Symbiosis. You can go and see it at the Eden Project um, in, in their recent Human Biome exhibition. And I just really love this image because it, She's woven, she's embroidered um, all of the different species of bacteria that you hold inside your body. And then you can see like the, a fetus inside, which, which actually uh, fetuses develop without um, the microbiome and then they, they gain that through vaginal birth. And so, you know, we're learning a lot about now the impact of, you know, having a cesarean instead of giving, you know, having a natural birth and, and things that we would have never thought of before if we didn't know how how much life is built on, on the cooperation of multiple organisms together. Yeah, so human beings are not really individuals, they're communities of organisms. This is Margaret McFaul Nagai, another hero of this field. Um, in the background, you can see um, the bobtailed squid, which was actually her, her focus as a scientist. She showed that um, the way this squid allows itself to be fluorescent is through the symbiosis of bacteria called Vibrio fischeri. Uh, and she really paved the way for all of the research you're seeing now on the microbiome by showing that this organism, this, this bobtailed squid, couldn't, can't develop without the presence of bacteria when it's an embryo. And so often in this field, you know, if you, if you have, you know, you look at the squid and you think of it as an organism in its own right, but then if you try and hatch, you know, squid, I think they come from eggs, I'm not sure, I'm, a, I'm an algae scientist, but if you try and hatch algae from uh, squid from their eggs and you take away the bacteria from that environment and the squid can't develop, like it cannot, it doesn't survive, then what does that imply for, you know, wh whether the squid is even a squid in its own right without bacteria, if it depends so tightly on the presence of bacteria to survive? Um, so, I know we're, we're running out of time, so I'm going to round off by telling you just a little, about, little bit about the microbiome and, and some of the recent research that's been coming out, just showing, you know, not just how, you know, uh, Philippa mentioned that there, you know, you've got millions of bacterial cells in your body. Your human cells are actually outnumbered nine to one compared to the bacterial cells in your body. So I like to think that I'm Phoebe, you know, I'm a human, but actually I'm 90% bacteria. Um, and I wonder how, you know, how we change the way we interact with each other and with life and with food and with soil if we really thought of ourselves as correctly these colonies of multiple bacteria. So this here is just a, an image from a paper where um, scientists noticed that uh, mice, if you, they, there are a lot of experiments going on where uh, they will basically grow a, a mouse or bring up a mouse in a laboratory where they remove the microbiome and then they, they look at all of the behaviors that happen there. Uh, and what they noticed is if they remove a certain species from the microbiome of mice, those mice start exhibiting signs of autism and other, with other species, depression and with other species, anxiety. And then when you reintroduce those bacteria, they see all of those symptoms disappear. I mean, even just that on its own is completely mind-blowing to think that we think that, um, you know, we think of some of these um, mental health issues or diseases as things that are genetic or things that are environmental. And then to, to see this with mice is, is totally mind-boggling and, and really calls into question, you know, 
who really has the, the reins here on, on your mood, on your appetite, on your, you know, on, on your behavior. So this is just a, a nice science-y diagram. Um, there is actually a, uh, a nerve called the vagus nerve that, that travels, connects directly from your brain into your upper uh, digestive tract, it's the vagus nerve. Um, and through this nerve, bacteria are actually able to directly uh, influence, like directly communicate with your central nervous system. They do this by, um, they, some of the bacteria in your microbiome break down food molecules into short chain fatty acids, which actually just on their own have an impact on mood, they have an impact on appetite, on sleep, on stress. On top of that, bacteria are involved in the synthesis of serotonin, in the synthesis of GABA, which are, these two are both um, neurotransmitters uh, that, you can, that, are, that are found in your brain that you synthesize yourself. So, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to scare you or to make this sinister, but um, I think it was in one of the papers I was reading recently, one of the scientists was talking about uh, the way bacteria modulate your behavior is a way of bacteria being in symbiosis with other organisms, because it's like they can be you know, if they can modulate your behavior, they can be basically communicating and influencing the outside world too. So this is just a, a clip I found from BBC News. It's quite funny. So just to finish off, um, I also just wanted to focus a little on the bacteria, the heroes of this talk. So for a long time, we thought of bacteria themselves as these single cell organisms that operate mainly alone. Uh, and the, the thing that I'm really interested in now and interested in doing uh, research in in the future is looking at uh, actually how bacteria themselves behave in large-scale symbioses. And really, we can't even look at bacteria anymore and define a bacteria as a single species, as a single cell. You need to look at the whole community of bacteria. So on this image, you can see uh, cells of a bacteria called E. coli and, a, and another one called uh, a sino A. Bailey, uh, and the, what's really interesting is under the electron microscope, what was seen was that these bacteria are forming nanowires and nanotubules together to share resources. And actually, multicellularity is the, is the rule, not the exception in bacteria. So what you have is, um, you know, for a long time, we've thought of bacteria as single cells, but actually the way they behave organically and naturally in nature is that they are never found alone as single cells. They are found in these multi-bacterial species, colonies, biofilms. Many of the diseases that we um, attribute to a single species of bacteria actually can only manifest as communities of bacteria. So if you think of plaque on your teeth, Plaque only um, works you know, for the bacteria. It's only damaging if there are certain species working together. So this is just to say like, you know, we are not, we were never one and bacteria themselves were never one either. They've always been cooperating and working together. Um, and in, in this species, uh, Myxococcus xanthus, Bacteria actually function together in these amazing colonies that do de you know, decentralized decision-making together, and they exhibit these behaviors of cooperation which are really, really mind-blowing. So um, here in this image, you can see a colony of this, this species of bacteria rippling as they go hunting for food, and together they'll segregate into different... Um, different types of the same bacteria and they, they produce different digestive enzymes so that they can specialize, almost like the way we have different cells specialized in different organs, these bacteria specialize into producing different chemicals that together can break down their food. Um, and I think in these colonies you have a segregation, like they segregate into doing different things. So one out of 10% of the population will go into a kind of spherical fruiting body which makes sure that they're safe in uh, dry conditions or high temperatures. Then you'll have like 60% of the cells turn into these roaming rod-like bacteria that go hunting for food. And then the remaining 30% uh, actually just go through programmed cell death and commit suicide to allow the rest of the bacteria to use their nutrients to go hunting. So it's like cooperation on a, yeah, on a level that we don't really see as humans. So this is just a quick, I'm, I'm gonna finish now because I'm eating into other people's time. 
but um, this is just a quick kind of synopsis of the different ways that uh, symbiosis can happen, and what is really key for symbiosis is communication and coordination. And I've kind of taken the liberty to be a bit um, imaginative or perhaps artistic in, in kind of continuing this list, because if you think of symbiosis as, as living together in communication, then you can start thinking about you know, the internet or light or language as other kind of new, uh, modulators of symbiosis or info chemicals. So at what scale do you really define an organism? I think I'll just finish with that. Thank you so much. <laughs>